In these troubling times, the urgency to trouble time, to shake it to its core, and to produce collective imaginaries that undo pervasive conceptions of temporality that take progress as inevitable, and the past is something that has passed and is no longer with us, is something so tangible, so visceral, that there is a sense in which it can be felt in our individual and collective bodies. This urgency is both new and not new. With fascism on the rise around the globe and the threat of accelerated nuclear arms race at hand tied to a perverse sense of the usability of nuclear weapons, the false security of global strategic deterrence based on MAD, the military doctrine of mutually assured destruction, left exposed and, un un and undone by madness, compulsiveness, and hubris, the 20th century is anything but past. The same can surely be said of previous centuries. And if debates on marking the origins of the Anthropocene suggest anything beyond an exacting reading of the layering of sediments used to justify adding a new segment of time to Earth's geological clock, it is perhaps that the structure of temporality that timelines in their linearity smuggle into the discussion that is inadequate to this moment. For if the climate experts in their official report to the International Geological Congress meeting in Cape Town in August of 2016 mark the origins of the new uh, epoch to be defined by the radioactive elements dispersed across the planet by nuclear bomb tests beginning in 1950, and strong arguments have been made by scientists and non-scientists that offer reasons for using other dates as the quote-unquote global spike. The debates have mostly been about laying down the marker at the right time, whether at 1492, 1610, 1945, 1950, or 1963 to 66. And they have not, for the most part, questioned whether these times ought to be thought of as falling in a line, as if they were separated from one another by temporal distance. But rather than understand these differing proposals as merely a simple disagreement about origins, perhaps we should take this as evidence that faith in the existence of a singular determinate origin and unilinear nature of time itself, the fact that only one moment exists at a time, is waning. Is there a sense of temporality that could provide a different way of positioning these markers of history and understand 1492 as living inside 1945, for example, and even vice versa? Over the course of the years, I've been working my way back to where I started, returning to the questions that have always been with me and continue to drive my work. The ones that drove me to become a student of the humanities in order to learn how to think about justice while I followed my intellectual passions into the world of physics. Coming back to the questions I wrestled with as I began my graduate studies in physics and became involved in anti-nuclear and other activist work. How can I be responsible for that which I love in the face of its violent historical legacy? and its continuing involvement in the military-industrial complex. Is there a way to do physics responsibly in the aftermath of the atomic bomb? Is the field itself so utterly tainted by and saturated with violence that there is no possibility of subversive participation? If, as feminist science studies scholars have convincingly argued, Ethical issues are not limited to the applications of scientific theories, but values are made together with facts inside the operations of what gets called pure science. Then are the very practices of theorizing and experimenting caught up in war making, capitalist pro projects of expansion and extraction, growth and development, such that they inevitably lead to the production of new forms of violence. How are its theories of space, time, and matter marked by gender, race, sexuality, nationalism, and colonialism? Can we find the traces of this violence 
even in its most abstract instantiations. And if this is so, are there nonetheless openings that exist within physics that might trouble its hegemony, its authority, its unapologetic epistemological imperialism that claims to cover all of space, time, and matter? Is there a way to use physics' own insights to undermine its entanglement with colonizing practices? Indeed, is it possible that inside such practices we might find radical political imaginaries that are resources for survival rather than destruction? Agential realism has been my attempt to begin to approach some of these questions. I've been committed to the political deconstructive project of opening up this seeming totality called physics with a capital P in order to nurture the cracks and bring forward its radical possibilities. Interestingly, this deconstructive dynamic, the inevitable generations of its own doings from within, is an insight that can be found within physics and not only within Derridian deconstruction, which is itself, I believe, a Derridian or indeed quantum insight. I want to be clear. The point is not to glorify physics, to leave it off the hook so as, uh, so as to be outside of politics, but on the contrary, to hold it accountable while at the same time being attuned to the radical political possibilities of its deconstructive openings, to the fact that it might indeed offer new material imaginaries, other possibilities, other worlds that are not merely to come, but exist in the thickness of the now. I also want to emphasize that it is important to keep in mind that the physics that I offer up for your consideration is not offered as the truth, capital T, from the scientists, capital S, as if from on high. But rather, a gentle realism combines insights from my own unique under way of understanding quantum physics as diffractively read through insights from a host of different theories that concern themselves with questions of social justice, including feminist, queer, trans, critical race theory, post-colonial and decolonial studies, Marxist theories, post-structuralism, and deconstruction. That is, the goal is nothing less than finding ways to engage in the practice of doing physics differently, in ways that lead its that that lends themselves to addressing injustices rather than merely reiterating, reinforcing, and proliferating them. A pine tree is time, and bamboo is time. Mountains are time, oceans are time. If time is annihilated, mountains and oceans are annihilated. Time itself is being, and all being is time. In essence, everything in the entire universe is intimately linked with each other as moments in time, continuous and separate. Time isn't what it used to be. Perhaps it never was. It surely hasn't been itself since the doomsday clock, an instrumental measure of time's own demise was set at just minutes to zero. Time has been shattered, imploded into bits, dispersed by the wind. Moments caught up in turbulent flows forming eddies, circling back around, returning, reconfiguring what will have been. Time is diffracted, entanglements of past, present, and future, superpositions of now, then, to come, caught up in and performing iterative undoings of the self in its sedimenting historicities. In these troubling times, how can we not trouble time? This talk is drawn from a larger work, which is about troubling times and about the nature of being in time, or rather, time being. It concerns itself with thickly entangled tales about the atom bomb, physics, war, militarism, imperialism, racism, and colonialism. Raising, raising questions of history, memory, and politics, this is a story of the inseparability of physics' destructive and deconstructive potentials. This account does not offer an alternative history so much as an alternative sense of history. 
It touches upon the coexistence of multiple material historicities condensed into a moment, an infinitesimal point of space-time mattering. When the splitting of a point, indeed its tiny nucleus, destroys cities and remakes the global geopolitical field, the tracing of entanglements might be a better analytical choice than any nested notion of scale. How large is an infinitesimal? What is the measure of nothingness? What would it take to be able to hear the silent cries, the murmuring silence of the void in its materiality and potentiality? What are the conditions of im slash possibilities of living, dying in voids produced by techno-scientific projects and other forms of colonial conquest. I just want to make a note about the fact that I'll be using a lot of slashes, and I think it really disrupts the flow of things. So instead of just saying im slash possibilities, by which I mean actually uh, something more than just both, and my students will recognize this from our discussions, that if there's a superposition, it represents an indeterminacy between the two. There's a kind of cutting together apart. And so the way that I do these pronunciations, I'll try to, is emphasize the im part, the, the first syllable. So I'll say impossibilities, and you're supposed to see the slash there in your mind. This next section of the paper is called Time Being. Matter fell from grace during the 20th century. It became mortal. Very soon after that, it was murdered, exploded at its core, torn to shreds, blown to smithereens. The smallest of smallest bits, the heart of an atom, was broken apart with a violence that made the earth and the gods quake. In an instant, in a flash of light brighter than a thousand suns, the distance between heaven and earth was obliterated. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. There was a time when matter stood outside of time, but in the intervening years between the two world wars, physicists broke with the more than 1,000-year-old tradition inherited from the Greeks and placed matter in the hands of time. Quantum field theory, a mixture of quantum theory, special relativity, and classical field theory, was responsible for this radical change in the order of things. Physicists began working on quantum field theory starting in the late 1920s, but quickly ran into difficulties. Most seriously, the so-called infinities problem, which was not resolved before the war. The war effort interrupted the development of the theory, at least in the West, because the same physicists who were hard at work on quantum field theory were called on to work on and take the lead on the development of new military technologies. This is not a coincidence. Nuclear physics, was developed alongside and inside quantum field theory. And many of the top physicists around the world were working on quantum field theory and nuclear physics. Skills, techniques, approaches to cracking hard problems, and more were traded back and forth between military research and the most abstract efforts in physics. In many ways, the war effort for physicists around the globe was discontinuous with work in pure theoretical physics. Whether time was marked as continuous or discontinuous, it is important and importantly not coincidental that the physicists working at the forefront of the development of quantum field theory were integrally involved in the production of wartime technologies, including the atom bomb. And it is perhaps no surprise then at the very core of quantum field theory are questions of time and being. So this next part of the paper is called Space-Time Diffractions and Superpositions of All Possible Histories. Oops, actually I think I want to go back, but I want to do this. There we go. Diffraction is a matter, matter of patterning attuned to difference. Waves make diffraction patterns precisely because multiple waves can be in the same place at the same time. And a given wave can be in multiple places at the same time. 
Particles do neither. By definition, particles are localized entities that take up space. They can be here or there, but not two places at once. However, it turns out that particles can produce diffraction patterns under specific circumstances. How can this be? According to quantum physics, this is because a given particle can be in a state of superposition, not just taking a position, but a superposition. To be in a state of superposition between two positions, for example, is not to be here or there, or even here and there, but rather it is to be indeterminately here, there. That is, it is not simply that the position is unknown, but rather there is no fact of the matter as to whether it is here or there. That is, it is a matter of ontological indeterminacy and not merely epistemological uncertainty. As a result of this indeterminacy of position, particles can in fact exhibit diffraction patterns under particular circumstances, or rather, when they do exhibit a diffraction pattern, it is an expression of the fact that they are in a state of superposition. Note that while it is tempting to say that a given particle in a state of superposition is in two places at once, this is a simplification that doesn't fully capture the complexities. For one thing, a particle by definition has a determinate position. For example, a particle is either here or there. And furthermore, if one were to perform a measurement to directly test the hypothesis that a particle is in two places at once, then it wouldn't be. Because a particle whose position is detected will behave like a good particle and only ever show up in one place at a time, else it wouldn't be a particle. So even though the pattern produced when the position uh, isn't being measured can only be accounted for as if it were in two places at once, that is, it behaves like a wave, in which case it isn't a particle. Patterns of difference, differencing, differencing, we might say, are arguably at the core of what matter is and are at the heart of how quantum physics understands the world. Indeed, Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman proposed an understanding of quantum physics based solely on the notion of diffraction, that is, superposition. To see this, it is first of all important to note that according to quantum physics, there is no determinate path that a particle takes in going from one position to another. That is, no such path exists. But what physicists can do is calculate the probability that a given particle that starts out here will wind up there. The quantum probabilities are calculated by taking account of all possible paths connecting the two points. In other words, a given particle that starts out here and winds up there is understood to be in a superposition of all possible paths between two points. Or in its four-dimensional quantum field theory elaboration, all possible space-time histories. But these possibilities are not to be thought of in the usual way. It is not that each history is merely possible and ultimately only one will be manifest. The very meaning of a superposition is that all possible histories are happening together. They all coexist and mutually contribute to this overall pattern, else there wouldn't be a diffraction pattern. Quantum physics opens up the possibility, another possibility beyond the relatively familiar phenomenon of spatial diffraction, namely temporal diffraction. The existence of temporal diffraction is due to a, a less well-known indeterminacy principle than the usual uh, position momentum indeterminacy principle, but something called the energy time indeterminacy principle. This indeterminacy principle plays a key role in quantum field theory. As a result of this indeterminacy principle, a given particle can be in a state of superposition of different times. For example, this one particle right here between my fi fingers can be in a state of coexisting at multiple times, for example, yesterday, today, tomorrow. 
Temporality is not merely multiple, but rather temporalities are specifically entangled and threaded through one another such that there is no determinate answer to the question, what time is it? This takes a bit of getting used to, even more so than spatial diffraction, but temporal diffraction has in fact been observed experimentally. And in an important sense, although it's not usually talked about this way, it lies at the core of quantum field theory. Indeed, it is possible to do a diffraction experiment in both space and time, whereupon a single particle will coexist in multiple places and times, and already I've cheated it just by saying it so simply. In the case of space-time diffraction, a diffraction pattern can be accounted for by taking account of all possible space-time histories, understanding that each such possibility coexists along with all others. This paper is itself a diffraction experiment in which I diffractively read different fragments of the atomic bomb through one another, most prominently using a novella by Kyoki Hayashi and the story of quantum field theory, which is being performatively crafted here as we go. Quantum field theory resides inside Hayashi's story, and Hayashi's story is in the interior of quantum field theory in its inner workings, a strange topology. Diffraction as method, as methodology, is a matter of reading insights through rather than against each other in an effort to make evident the always already entanglement of specific ideas in their materiality. The point will not be to make analogies, but rather to explore patterns of differentiating entangling that not only sprout from specific material conditions, but are enfolded into the patternings in ways that trouble binaries such as macro-micro, nature-culture, center-periphery, and general specific that tempt and support analogical analysis. The section of the paper is called From Trinity to Trinity. Time and being are themes at the heart of From Trinity to Trinity, a remarkable novella by award-winning author Kyoko Hayashi. Hayashi has spent the past three decades chronicling the experience, the experiences of hibaksha explosion-affected people, atomic bomb victims. Having at age 14 lived through an event that refuses to end, that decays with time but will forever continue to happen, she has spent time laboring through times, travel hopping, in order to unpack some of the infinite density of one very particular space-time point, Nagasaki, Japan, August 9, 1945, 11.02 a.m. Kyoko Hayashi's novella From Trinity to Trinity traces the space-time wanderings of an older, unnamed woman on a spiritual, political pilgrimage, a journey of returning to a land she had never visited before, but knew better than the geography of her own body, a land whose wounds and woundedness live inside her bones, literally, materially. Making her way to Trinity, to Trinity site in New Mexico, where the first plutonium atomic bomb test took place, Hayashi's protagonist travel hops from one space-time point to another, circling back, returning and turning our attention to a multiplicity of entangled, violent colonial histories condensed into August 9. She is at once in Nagasaki working alongside classmates in the Mitsubishi Arms Factory. On a U.S. Air Force base in New Mexico, visiting the National Atomic Museum as a lone Japanese visitor among otherwise white tourists who were there to learn about the U.S. nuclear defense history and in the 16th century North America when Spanish explorers invaded the land now called New Mexico. Her goal is not one of personal healing per se, but rather a political and spiritual commitment to take responsibility for remembering the countless, law, uh, the countless people who were robbed of their own deaths by unspeakable violence. Centering the relationship between time and justice together with Derrida she might have said that what drives her 
is, quote, this responsibility and this respect for justice concerning those who are not there, those who are no longer, or who are not yet present and living. From Trinity to Trinity is a story that embodies questions of history, memory, politics, nationalism, colonialism, race, species, violence, and sensuality. Her point is not merely to make sense out of senselessness as if a rational story could be made of the madness or a refreshingly mad story made of the irrationalisms, but rather to take hold of the radical possibilities of the undoing of August 9. This is a journey across space, time, nation, state, species, being, and questions of being, non-being. But it should not be mistaken for a time travel story, not in the usual sense. This travel hopping tale is very different from time travel novels where the protagonist is an autonomous unified subject who continues to live in the time of their present while returning to a past that once was a past that continues to exist and remains accessible to those with sufficient ingenuity and technological know-how in an attempt to rework some crucial point in a chain of events that will then propagate forward in deterministic fashion in a rewriting of history. Rather, Hayashi's travel hopping does not lend itself to such stories. In Hayashi's story, what is at stake is not setting time aright as if it were possible, but rather the undoing of time, of universal time, of the notion that moments exist one at a time, everywhere the same, and replace one another in succession. It is also a story of time being that undoes the unified notion of self and what it means to be human. The travel hopper must risk her sense of self, which never will have been one or itself. Travel hopping, tracing the entanglements of space-time mattering, is not the same as writing a linear chronology mistaken for personal or collective history. Travel hopping is the embodied material labor of cutting through and undoing colonialist thinking in an attempt to come to terms with the unfathomable violences of colonialism in their specific material entanglements. How else might she begin to approach the infinite inhumanity of these weapons of mass, weapons of instantaneous mass destruction that in a flash obliterates time? This next part of the paper is called Tracing Entanglements and the Material Traces of Erasure. Tracing paths is no easy task. It takes work. During the waning decades of the 20th century, the most murderous century by some accounts in history, the notion that the past might be open to revision through a quantum eraser came to the fore. The quantum eraser experiment is a, is a variation of a two-slit diffraction experiment, an experiment which Feynman said contains all the mysteries of quantum physics. Against this fantastic claim of the possibility of erasure, I will argue that in paying close attention to the material labors entailed, the claim of erasure's possibility fades, at least full erasure, while at the same time bringing to the fore a relational ontology, ontology sensibility to questions of time, memory, and history. The key features of the quantum eraser experiment are as follows. Recall that the famous two-slit experiment, which can be used to show that particles under the right conditions exhibit wave behavior like the top diagram, okay? that they, namely that they produce diffraction patterns. This pattern is produced only if each particle goes through both openings at once, as a good wave does. On the other hand, if you modify a two-slit apparatus by adding a device to measure which slit a particle goes through, like in the bottom diagram where I've introduced a flashlight to illuminate the slit so we can watch, it does in fact go through one slit or the other like a good particle, contributing to the creation of a scatter pattern and not a diffraction pattern. Now here's where the quantum eraser part comes in. 
Because if the experimenter adds a device that enables the erasure of the information about which slit a particle goes through after it's already gone through the diffraction grating, remarkably a diffraction pattern appears, indicating that each particle will have gone through both slits at once. Well, let me just say a teeny bit more about this, although I don't want to get too far off track because it's since I have to explain the physics and do what I want to do with it for you, it takes a while. But let me just explain that what's at stake here is that if you do a witch slit experiment, it's behaving like a particle. That in the, in the top one, I'm just doing a regular diffraction experiment. I get a diffraction pattern for particles, which means that they're actually behaving like waves. In the bottom, in the middle slit, I've introduced a witch slit detector and now I get a scatter pattern for particles. It's no longer behaving like a wave because I've asked the question of which slit it goes through. Waves go through two slits at once or multiple slits at once, just like water waves you could think of. But the middle slit, uh, the middle diagram rather, shows that if I have a which slit detector, then I'm going to get a particle pattern actually. I've changed the ontology, not just disturbed something, which we've talked about a lot in my class. And then the bottom diagram is trying to show that if I erase after the particle has already gone through the which slit detector, if I erase the information about which slit it has gone through, it will, there will be a diffraction pattern that I can find by tracing the entanglements. And what we're saying then, and I can delay whether I'm going to erase the information or not till after it starts contributing, that particular pattern starts, con particle con uh, starts contributing to the pattern, which means that we have the future interior at stake here, which is that we're saying that whether it will have gone through one slit or another as a good particle, or whether it will have gone through both slits together like a good wave, can be determined after the particle has already gone through and hit the screen. We talked about that a lot today. So this raises the seeming impossible possibility that one can determine after the fact whether the particle will have gone through one slit or the other, like a particle does, or through both slits at the same time, like a wave, after it has already passed through the entire diffraction grating and made a mark on the screen. This claim, the claim then made by physicists who proposed and conducted the quantum eraser experiment claim that this is evidence of changing the past. But it's important to slow down and carefully examine the evidence behind this claim because the nature of time and being, or rather time being, itself is in question and can't be assumed. For one thing, the experimenters underestimate the nature of the evidence at hand. This is my claim. What this experiment tells us is not simply that a given particle will have done something different in the past, but that the very nature of its being, its ontology in the past, remains open to future reworkings. Whether it will have been a wave or a particle, which is defined to be ontologically different kinds in physics. So in particular, I have argued that this experiment offers empirical evidence for a relational ontology, or rather perhaps more accurately, a hauntology, and against a metaphysics of presence. Some people have thought that Derrida would be rolling over in his grave to hear of empirical evidence for a hauntology, but I think he would be delighted. The physicists who propose the quantum eraser experiment interpret these results as the possibility of changing the past. They speak of the diffraction pattern as having been recovered, as if the original pattern returned and the witch slit information as having been entirely erased. But this interpretation is based upon assumptions that are being called into question by this very experiment. Assumptions concerning the nature of being and time. Crucially, the diffraction pattern is not immediately evident once the information is erased. That is, it is not the case that the original diffraction pattern returns. Rather, a new diffraction pattern can be found within the scatter pattern if and only if the experimenter is clever enough to engage in the labor of tracing the existing entanglements. This point is crucially important 
for the labor expended in tracing the entanglements, including figuring out how to find the extant entanglements and then tracing them, is a necessary step in making the experiment work. Remarkably, this experiment makes evident that entanglements survive the measurement process, and furthermore, that material traces of attempts at erasure can be found in tracing the entanglements. Indeed, these experiments show that while it is possible to erase particular marks that seem to suggest that the past, the past, the past that is finished, okay, has been changed. It is a fantasy to believe that this constitutes an erasure of all traces of history. Erasure is a material practice that leaves its trace in the very worlding of the world. I have argued that an interpretation that seems to be in better accord with the empirical evidence that, uh, what, than the one offered by the original experimenters is that while the past is never finished and the future is not what will unfold, the world holds, or rather is, the memories of its iterative reconfigurings. All reconfigurings, including atomic blasts, violent ruptures and tears in the fabric of being, of space-time mattering, are sedimented into the world in its iterative becoming and must be taken into account in an objective analysis. The next section of the paper is called History, Memory, and Traces of Erasure on the Way to Trinity. Soon my eyes caught some big letters on a panel. Countdown to Nagasaki. Hayashi's protagonist is visiting the National Atomic Museum in New Mexico, an unexpected stop on the way to Trinity site. I felt time in front of the pan I felt time stop in front of the panel, count down to Nagasaki. While the time towards death in Nagasaki was ticking, what were Kana and I doing in the Ohashi arms factory? At the very moment the bomb left the plane, I was trying to locate the sound of a small roar the factory chief told us he had just heard. I closed my eyes and bowed my head to the photograph. The ruin of a fire printed underneath the explanation was the city of Nagasaki with Inaseyama across the river. The effect appears to be the same as Hiroshima, boxcar pilot Sweeney said in the first reports of the attack on Nagasaki. A majority of the city has been suddenly destroyed. So even though I am watching the actual scene, I cannot believe it. Here is the photograph of the destroyed city. The photo shows a burned field, but under what is seen on that printed paper is Teacher T, who died instantly, and classmates A, O, and others. In this brief passage where chronology has no place or pace, where multiple temporalities present themselves without any one of them being present, their very coexistence disassembling the allegedly determinate distinction between memory and history, Hayashi offers us a pointed contestation of official museum history, a tale told in chronological time, a scientized and sanitized account of objective reality, the God's eye view from above, the view from nowhere. Disrupting this chronology helps us see through the photograph to what is behind it, namely all the various material discursive apparatuses of production that make up this exhibit, what it contains, what it erases, which facts matter, and how they are collected and framed. What the official photo shows is an aerial view of a city destroyed, the leveling of buildings into a structural void. What the museum history invisil invisibilizes is the structure of the void, the entangled material histories of death and dying, all the ravages of untold violence, histories of colonialism, racism, and militarism, and all the attempted erasures that constitute it. By contrast, what is at stake for Hayashi is a matter of empirical reality, the reality literally on the ground. We come to see that what the photo shows is not the bare facts of history, but rather a record of erasures, the literal erasure of lives obliterated like so many buildings, people in the streets on foot and on bicycles, workers stacking shelves in multiple neighborhood shops, 
school children working in factories, old people and children in their homes, but also a particular framing of the event that makes use of distance to sanitize the suffering and devastation of lives while erasing some histories of violence and not others. Erasures upon erasures. But erasures are never complete. Traces always remain. In her disjointed time hopping, Hayashi's narrator is bodily tracing these extant entanglements. The official photograph freezes time and reifies space, but there were other photographs taken during the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Photographs on the ground, not ones engineered by humans designed to capture the successes of military operations, but rather very close up and personal photos taken by the bomb itself. Shadows of incinerated bodies, human and non-human, captured on walls and made into photographic plates by the intensity of the blast. What lies inside the boundaries of a shadow? Where are its edges? Diffraction unsettles colonialist assumptions about space and time, beginnings and ends, continuity and discontinuity, interior and exterior. Standing in the museum, she notes another integral part of the official museum history and its contemporary framing. There were no black or Mexican visitors, not only in this museum, but also in Los Alamos and at the Trinity site, all the visitors were white. Jumping in time, but continuing the thought, Hayashi introduces another invisibilized piece of the story, one so covered over by colonialism's practices of erasure an erasure of erasure that the white visitors might at least at first question its relevance. What is the story of this very land that the museum stands on <clears throat> and that on which the bomb was first dropped? It is a story of late 16th century European colonial conquest of Native American peoples and lands entangled with early 20th century U.S. colonial annexation of New Mexico in the wake of the U.S. invasion of Mexico half a century earlier, entangled with the wartime designation of native lands, lands deemed uninhabited as Trinity site, entangled with existing and future cancers of the no bodies who were downwind from the test site. Importantly, attempts at erasure always leave material traces. What is erased is preserved in the entanglements in the diffraction patterns of being becoming. In tracing the material entanglements extant in practices of erasure, Hayashi's narrator gives us a sense of how boundaries of lands and bodies get diffractively materialized and sedimented through one another. The various forms of violence, including all the erasures, are written into the very fabric of the world, into the specific configuring of space-time mattering, so that it is crucial that she make the pilgrimage to trace the entanglements with her marked and wounded body. Hayashi's narrator bodily traces these entanglements of colonialist histories, violent erasures, and avoidances as an integral part of a sacred practice of remembering, which is not a going back to what was, but rather a material reconfiguring of space-time mattering in ways that attempt to do justice to account for the devastation wrought and to produce openings, new possible histories, reconfigurings of space-time mattering through which time beings might find a way to endure. The next section of the paper is called Quantum Field Theory and Rememberings, the Undoing of Self and the Counterpolitics to Colonialism's Avoidances and Erasures. Land occupation as a mode of empire building has been and continues to be tied to a logics of the void. Justification for occupying land is often given on the basis of colonialist practices of traveling to new lands and discovering all matter of voids. For example, population voids, lands allegedly unpopulated before the arrival of the settlers. Voids of ownership, of development, of, of territorial sovereignty. Land devoid of civilization or of inhabitants with labor relations to the land. The doctrine of terra nullius is one such example of empire building. 
Whatever the specific nature of the alleged absence, a particular understanding of the notion of the void defines the colonialist practices of avoidances and erasures. The void occupied a central place in Newton's natural philosophy. He wavered about the existence of an ether permeating empty space, but unlike many of his contemporaries who were still committed Aristotelians and equated matter with extension, Newton insisted that the void was a spatial frame of reference within and against which motion takes place. Matter is discrete and finite, and the void is continuous and infinite. The void extends indefinitely in all directions, and bits of matter take their place in the void. All in all, the void is quite literally universal, measuring the full extent of the universe and beyond, and therefore only very sparsely populated. And since property rests with matter as one of its founding characteristics, the absence of matter is the absence of property, and also the absence of energy, work, and change. The void in classical physics is that which literally doesn't matter. It is merely that which frames what is absolute. So while the so-called voyages of discovery, bringing data including astronomical and tidal changes called from European journeys to non-European sites aided Newton in his efforts to develop a natural philosophy that united heaven and earth, Newtonian physics helped consolidate and give scientific credence to colonialist endeavors to make claims on land that were said to be devoid of culture and reason. If classical physics insists that the void has no matter and no energy, the quantum principle of ontological indeterminacy, in particular the indeterminacy relation between energy and time, calls into question the existence of such a zero energy, zero matter state or rather makes it into a question with no decidable answer. Not a settled matter, or rather no matter. And if the energy of the vacuum is not determinately zero, it isn't determinately empty, since energy and matter are equivalent. Forgive me for saying this, E equals MC squared. I hope everybody doesn't get up and leave now. That is, according to quantum field theory, the vacuum can't be determinately nothing, because the indeterminacy principle allows for fluctuations of the vacuum. How can we understand vacuum fluctuations? If the physicist's conception of a field can be likened to a drumhead, with a zero energy state being akin to a perfectly still drumhead, and a field with finite energy being a drumhead in one of its quantized vibrational modes, like the 3D analog of harmonics of a string, then while the classical vacuum state would be perfectly still without any vibrations, a quantum vacuum state, although it allegedly has zero energy, is not determinately still as a result of the energy time indeterminacy principle. So vacuum fluctuations are the indeterminate vibrations of the vacuum or zero energy state. Indeed, the vacuum is far from empty for it is filled with all possible indeterminate yearnings of space-time mattering, or in this drum analogy, the vacuum is filled with the indeterminate murmurings of all possible sounds. It is a speaking silence. What stories of creation and annihilation is the void telling us? How might we approach the possibility of listening? Putting this point in complementary language of particles rather than fields, we can understand vacuum fluctuations in terms of the existence of virtual particles. Virtual particles are the quanta of the vacuum fluctuations. That is, virtual particles are quantized indeterminacies in action. Virtuality is the indeterminacy of being non-being, a ghostly non-existence. The void is a spectral realm. Not even nothing can be free of ghosts. Virtual particles do not traffic in a metaphysics of presence. They do not exist in space and time. They are ghostly non-existences that teeter on the edge of the infinitely thin blade between being and non-being, 
They speak of indeterminacy, or rather, no determinate words are spoken by the vacuum, only a speaking silence that is neither silence nor speech, but the conditions of impossibility for non-existence. There are an infinite number of possibilities, but not everything is possible. The vacuum isn't empty, but neither is there anything in it. Hence, we can see that indeterminacy is key not only to the existence of matter, but also to its non-existence, that is, to the nature of the void. In fact, this indeterminacy is responsible not only for the void not being nothing, while not being something, but it may, in fact, be the source of all that is, a womb that births existence. Particles, together with their antiparticles and pairs, can be created out of the vacuum by putting the right amount of energy into the vacuum, thereby giving a virtual particle-antiparticle pair enough energy to emerge from the vacuum. That's what happens down the street here at CERN in trying to find a Higgs particle, the Higgs boson. You have to put enough energy in by colliding particles at very, very high energy to get a Higgs boson to pop out of the vacuum. <clears throat> so similarly, particles together with their antiparticles in pairs can go back into the vacuum, emitting the excess energy. Hence, birth and death are not the sole prerogative of the animate world. So-called inanimate beings also have finite lives. Particle, quote, particles can be born and particles can die, explains one physicist. In fact, it is a matter of birth, life, and death that requires the development of a new subject in physics, that of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a response to the ephemeral nature of life, unquote. The void is a lively tension, not an opposition between living and dying, but a dynamism of indeterminacy a threading through of one with the other, a desiring orientation towards being, becoming, which necessarily entails living, dying. The vacuum is far from empty. Rather, it is flush with yearning, with innumerable possibilities, imaginings of what was, could be, might yet have been, all coexisting. Don't for a minute think that there are no material effects of yearning and imagining. Virtual particles are experimenting with the im- possibilities of yearning, I'm sorry, of impossibilities of non-being, but that doesn't mean they aren't real. On the contrary, consider this headline. It's confirmed matter is merely vacuum fluctuations. The article explains that most of the mass of an atom, its nucleus made of protons and neutrons, which uh, constitute the bulk of an atom, is due not to its constituent particles, the quarks, which only account for 1% of the mass, but rather to the contributions from virtual particles. The void can no longer be thought of as that which doesn't matter. Quantum field theory not only reworks the classical understanding of the void, but also of matter in the inseparability of the void and matter. Consider the classical physics view of an electron, one of the simplest particles, a point particle of zero dimensions, no internal structure. So not only is it without extension, it is without an interior, completely devoid of structure, and yet it causes a great deal of trouble both for classical and quantum physics. According to quantum field theory, as a result of the time being in determinacy, the electron does not exist as an isolated particle but is always already inseparable from the wild activities of the vacuum. That is, the electron is always already interacting with the virtual particles of the vacuum in every imaginable way. So let's take a peek into the electron, whatever that means since it doesn't have an interior, into the electron and the infinite number of wild things going on. Electrons are charged particles, which means they are susceptible to, or we might even say inclined towards, touching and being touched. Indeed, touching, according to physics, is but an electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. The reason the desk feels solid, or the cat's coat feels soft, or we can even hold coffee cups in one another's hands is an effect of electromagnetic repulsion. 
All we ever really feel is the electromagnetic force, not the other whose touch we seek. The electromagnetic force experienced between two charged particles depends upon the relative nature of their charges. Opposites attract and like charges repel one another. Now since a charged particle emits an electromagnetic field and charged particles positioned in electromagnetic fields feel an electromagnetic force on them, the electron being charged both emits and interacts with its own field. This self-touching interaction, a constitutive part of what an electron is, turns out to be the source of unending anxiety in the physics community. Commenting specifically on the electron self-energy interaction, the physicist Richard Feynman expressed horror at the electron's monstrous nature and its perverse ways of engaging with the world. Quote, instead of going directly from one point to another, the electron goes along for a while and suddenly a photon is emitted and then horrors, it absorbs its own photon. Perhaps there is something immoral about that, but the electron does it. <laughs> this self-energy, self-touching term has also been labeled a perversion of the theory because its value is infinite, which is an unacceptable answer to any question about the nature of an electron, such as what is its mass or charge. Apparently, touching oneself or being touched by or in touch with oneself, the ambiguity may itself be the key to the trouble, is not simply troubling, but a moral violation, the very source of all the trouble. This from Richard Feynman, who played a key role in the making of the atomic bomb. But it's worse, or we might say better than that, <laughs> for this simple self Energy interaction is not a process that happens in isolation either. All kinds of more involved interaction, all kinds of more involved things can and do occur in the interaction with this frothy brew of nothingness. In fact, there is a virtual exploration of every possibility, an infinite set of possibilities of self-touching. So there is an infinity of infinities, because each of the self-touching diagrams, like the one in the middle, that's the one he's describing, or the one here, that's a more complicated self-touching, where it's touching some other particle, anti-particle creation in the, in the void. And then there are many other possibilities. And so each one of these loops is an infinity mathematically, and then there are an infinity of infinities. Okay. So in fact, Richard Feynman proposed, I love this, a renormalization procedure that attempts to reel in the electron's queerness, its unruliness. So according to this procedure, the bare electron, which is mathematically infinite, by the way, I'm using bare, notions of bare and dressed and so on, that's technical language used by physicists, okay? So according to this renormalization procedure, the bare electron, which is mathematically infinite, is dressed with the infinite contributions of the virtual particles of the vacuum, such that in the end, the physical electron is finite. Any decent, proper electron is going to be dressed. Okay, so that is what renormalization entails is the subtraction of two infinities to get something finite. This renormalization procedure entails taking into account all possible interactions with all virtual particles in all possible ways, that is, all possible histories. Hence, according to quantum field theory, even the smallest bits of matter are an enormous multitude. Each individual is made up of all possible histories of virtual interactions with all others, or rather, according to quantum field theory, there is no such thing as a discrete individual with its own roster of properties. In fact, the other, the constitutively excluded, is always already within. The very notion of self is a troubling of the interior-exterior distinction. Matter, is the matter and the indeterminacy of its being 
undoes identity and settles the ver- and unsettles the very foundations of non-being. Together with Derrida, we might then say, identity can only affirm itself as identity to itself by opening itself to the hospitality of a difference from itself or a difference with itself. Conditions of the self, such a difference from and with itself would then be its very thing, the stranger at home. What is being called into question here is the very nature of self. All selves are not themselves, but rather time beings. The self is dispersed, diffracted through being and time. In an undoing of inside-outside distinction, it is undecidable whether there is an implosion of otherness or a dispersion of self throughout space-time mattering. Hence, matter is an enfolding, an involution. It can't help touching itself. And in this self-touching, it comes into contact with the infinite alterity that it is. Ontological indeterminacy and unending dynamism of the opening up of possibilities is at the core of mattering. How strange that indeterminacy and its infinite undoing of closure is the conditions for the possibility of all structures in their dynamic, dynamically reconfiguring stabilities and instabilities. According to quantum field theory, then, the void is not absence. Indeed, nothingness is an infinite plentitude, not a thing, but a dynamics of iterative reopenings that cannot be disentangled from what matters. So I'm at the last section of the paper. This section is entitled, Returning and Remembering. Ironically, the land that was denounced as a wilderness, wilderness in which no white people's culture could prosper became cultivated by the invaders' bloody battles and desires, writes Hayashi. Every hibaksha knows their survival carries within it the wailing and silence of the dead. The climax of the novella is the narrator's trip to Trinity site, the place where the first plutonium bomb was detonated on July 16, 1945 at 5.29 a.m. It is here at the end of her journey, the very place where it all began, standing in the midst of a desert, inside a fenced area with nothing inside it save a monument to nothingness, to ground zero, that the fullness of these embodied tracings of all the various colonial entanglements comes full circle. Hayashi is committed to being a chronicler of August 9. Given that she deliberately writes against the grain of chronology, perhaps Hayashi's commitment to tracing the material entanglements condensed into the space-time point of August 9 might be more aptly captured by the more unconventional title, Time sorry, Travel Hopping Scribe of August 9. From Trinity to Trinity is not a time travel novel, but a diffraction tale, an embodied pilgrimage committed to tracing the material entanglements, a risky journey, journey of placing one's body in touch with all matter of specific colonialist histories, an iterative circling back around, touching the infinite alterity that constitutes a point. What is the structure of the infinity of a point labeled on some calendars as August 9? Returning to a point to face the incalculable. Being an August 9 travel hopping scribe is different from being a historian. For one thing, it involves making the journey in space and time, tracing the multiple histories with one's body, putting the self at risk as a part of a committed responsibility to those who have died and those not yet born. It entails recognizing material kinship with this exploded, imploded moment in time. I am going to Trinity, she tells her friend. The truth is, even today, I still want to break away from August 9. I have always wished I was not related to August 9. 
Katsura, my son, is a second generation Hibaksha. He dislikes being an inmate on death row without a prison term. He wanted to live away from August 9. Trinity is the starting point of my August 9. It is also the final destination of Hibaksha. From Trinity to Trinity. If I make that journey, I can hold August 9 within my life circle. If I can never be free from the event, I should end my relationship by swallowing it. What does it mean to swallow an event? Perhaps this is an evocation of the Ouroboros, the mythical symbol of the serpent biting its tail, representing creation out of destruction, life out of death. Or perhaps it means to ingest the event like radiation, to take it into your gut, to feel it leach into your bones, mutate your innards, and reset your cellular clocks. Perhaps it is about the impossibility of metabolizing the trauma, transforming the self from victim to survivor. Perhaps it is a way of undoing the self, of touching oneself through touching all others, taking in the multitude of others that make up the very matter of one's being in order to materially transform the self and one's material sense of self. Perhaps it is about a willingness, willingness to put oneself at risk, to place one body, one's body on the wounded land, to be in touch with it, to have a felt sense of its textures, to come to terms with a shared sense of vulnerability and invisibility, to feel the ways that this land, this void, which marks the colonizers' continuing practices of avoidances, always already inhabits the core, the nucleus of your being. I walked to ground zero. From this point in July, 50 years ago, the flash of light of the atomic bomb ran in all directions in the desert. I heard, beautiful. <laughs> I paid them a lot of money to know. <clears throat> I heard that on the day of the experiment, it had been raining hard since morning, unusual in New Mexico. The experiment was carried out in the heavy rain. The flash of light boiled the downpour, and with the white froth ruined the fields, burned the helpless mountains, and shot up to the sky. And then silence. Without time to defend and fight back, the wilderness was forced into silence. Let us pause before this silence, or non-silence as it were, which is very appropriate, I think, before rushing on. This silence threaded through with all matter of murmuring, so many cries that might yet have been but never were. From the bottom of the ground, from the exposed red faces of faraway mountains, from the brown wasteland, the waves of silence came lapping and made me shudder. How hot it must have been. Until now, as I stand at the Trinity site, I have thought that it was we humans who were the first atomic bomb victims on Earth. I was wrong. Here are my senior hibaksha. They are here but cannot cry or yell. Tears filled my eyes. Here at ground zero, time being was shaken to its core. Matter was split off from itself, traumatized. Violence tears holes in the very fabric of the world in its sedimenting, iterative interactivity. Woundedness is not reserved for human beings. Landscapes are not stages, containers, or mere environments for human and non-human actors. Landscape is not merely visually akin to a body. It is the skin of the earth. Land is not property or territory. It is a time being, a material geobiography of bones and bodies, ashes and earth, where death and life meet. Etymologically, entanglements already hint at a troubling of assumed boundaries between allegedly different kinds. Earth, humus, is part of the etymology of human. And similarly, Adam, humankind, derives from Adama, the Hebrew for ground, 
land, earth, giving lie to the assertions of firm distinctions between human and non-human, suggesting a relationship of kin rather than kind, a cutting together apart. Time beings do not merely inhabit, but rather are of the landscape. The space-time mattering of the world in its sedimenting enfoldings of iterative interactivity. Memory is not merely a subjective capacity of the human mind, rather human and mind are part of the land timescape of the world. Memory is written into the worlding of the world in its specificity, the ineliminable traces of the sedimenting historicity of its iterative reconfigurings. No wonder Hayashi understands land in this case, this marked void, this silenced land, as the ground for respectful, just, and non-violent mourning for remembering. Remembering is a bodily activity tied to the materiality of the land as time being. She must place her body on this wounded land in order to hear its murmuring silences and muted cries to remember and reconfigure the space-time mattering of all habaksha in their material entanglements. I have always been aware of being a habaksha, but as soon as I started walking through the small passage within the fenced area led by my guide, my always already awareness of being a victim disappeared from my mind. It was as if I became 14 years old again. I may have been walking towards an unknown ground zero as though I were someone from the time before August 9, but it was when I stood in front of the memorial that I truly was exposed to the atomic bomb. Looking back, I did not shed a tear on August 9. As I ran with the pack of people whose hands, feet, faces no longer looked human, no tears came to me. For the first time here at Trinity, however, I might be crying with human tears that I did not shed on August 9. Standing on the land that speaks no words, I shivered, feeling a pain. Until today, I have lived with the merciless pains that hurt my mind and body. But it could have been the pains of the skin that grew from August 9. Here in the desert, I have momentarily forgotten my life as a baksha. It is here, in the midst of nothingness, the place where living and dying meet, where time being is indeterminately multiple and filled with all matter of desiring impossibilities that the travel hopping scribe can finally lay to rest her 52 classmates who were denied their own deaths. Long ago, she had taken on the responsibility for the 52 and carried them around with her all these years. It is in putting herself at risk and risking her sense of self this embodied work of remembering that she can finally release her tears and let them rain down on the ground. In returning to nothingness, she brings one void in its particularity, Nagasaki, to another trinity. Not to renormalize these infinite violences, avoidances, and erasures, but to bring to bear the clouds of impossibilities that surround these entangled events. What does it mean to confront the nothingness, to touch its fullness? This is a question that cannot be answered in the abstract, not once and for all, but must be asked over and over again with one's body. The question which must be lived returns us to a question that had been held in sp suspension. For whom is ground zero empty? Clearly this land is far from empty. On the contrary, it is teeming with all matter of impossibilities, material conditions of living and dying. Living and dying in this void are a multitude of beings excluded from the designation human. Not only those beings living here at ground zero at the time of the Trinity test, including rattlesnakes, insects, plants, rocks, and soil, but also all those time beings downwind from the test site, including those who don't get counted as fully human, together with the ghosts of their deceased ancestors and their future offspring. That is, what resides in the void are all those who endure despite layering upon layering of colonial and racialized violence, all those whom, whom the human counts as other. 
including those marked as subhuman, non-human, inhuman. In fact, the parcel of Turtle Island, design- this is a quote, in fact, the parcel of Turtle Island designated as the wilderness of New Mexico on and around Trinity site is home to 19 American Indian Pueblos, two Apache tribes, and some chapters of the Navajo Nation, unquote. The fact that there were 19,000 people living within a 50-mile radius of the secret test is something that has uh, been ignored by the U.S. government until 2014. But unfortunately, is also not mentioned by Hayashi, though they surely belong among her kin. But it was not widely known, in all fairness. So for Hayashi, it is precisely the question of remembering and just mourning that defines being human. What makes us human for her is not our alleged distinctiveness from the non-human, the inhuman, those denied animacy and defined by their indifference, the subhuman, humans that don't count as fully human, those that do not matter, but rather our relationship with and responsibility to the dead, to the ghosts of the past and the future. Her pilgrimage is a work of mourning, a concerted ongoing labor, never finished nor complete. Hayashi's political ethical commitment to the activism of remembering the Hibakusha has been a life practice of tracing the entangled violences of colonialism, racism, nationalism dispersed across space time. Crucial to this ongoing labor of mourning is the work of decomposition, composting, turning over the humus, undoing the notion of the human founded on the poison soil of human exceptionalism, not in order to privilege all other beings over the human in some perverse reversal, but in order to begin to come to terms with the infinite depths of our inhumanity and the infinite possibility for living and dying otherwise. Thank you.